This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Uh, we are gathered here tonight. Uh, welcome to the Mead House. So first thing uh, we want to do is introduce everybody. Ryan Richardson in the house. Aaron Martin along for the ride. Mississippi Chris Spencer. He's going to be talking about something very special coming around Christmas time uh, here uh, for our listeners. Jeff Schaus is in the house. My name is J.D. Webb. Welcome, welcome again to the Mead House. Uh, and usually about this time, we, uh, we like to mention people's names and, uh, I've been turning to Jeff, uh, Jeff's been cruising around the Facebook pages and uh, looking for interesting things to bring up. Jeff, what have you found this week? I've got a couple quick shout outs this week. Uh, let's see from, uh, from the mead group. I have Brent Tennant had the, a, uh, a couple capsaicin on there. One with some ancho chilies, um, he says, was uh, a mild kind of spicy for the weaklings. And then the one he was really proud of was a chipotle mead. He had it said it had a great smoky flavor and a really good amount of heat to it. it sounded really delicious. So well, glad to hear about that. That sounds like coming up with some really interesting concoctions. Ancho chilies, um, huh? Ancho chilies. Um, wasn't that uh, the one we got from from uh, Ricky uh, from uh, Groenfell? Wasn't that one made with ancho chilies? Yeah, that was uh, ancho chili and uh, cocoa or chocolate. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Anxious to hear about that one too, Jeff. Go ahead. And then another one uh, that I wanted to throw out from uh, from Tom Rapus on the. Um, uh, the Mead Makers group, he had a really interesting post that I was kind of nerding out over uh, regarding some taste testing where he was trying to hone in on the amount of uh, a, a tannin for one of the red piments he was working on. Uh, he and his wife set up um, essentially just a, a, a tannin solution and some different combinations and did a little taste test of their own to see which one they like, try to dial in the amount of flavor in there. Uh, and then when they got between two that they were really liking, they set up a second taste test with um, both of those and then a, a middle of the road concentration. Um, so they could they could test those out a little bit further. Um, really great uh, method. Really interesting, interesting discussion. I mean, go check that out. It, he goes into a lot more detail than I can go into here. Um, so which, really worthwhile. Which, uh, which group is that? That was the Mead Makers group. Mead Makers. Perfect. Okay. And Tom's a pretty active guy on there, so uh, a lot of good information from him. Then uh, the, the last one I had for tonight um, comes from the lead group again. Um, guy named Eugene Stover is asking about um, a, a, a black raspberry coffee mead that he did, um, and it looks like he has he has a lot going into this. He starts with some some black raspberry jam, some Tanzanian pea berry coffee, like the, the brewed coffee, along with some of the coffee beans. Um, and then in secondary later, it sounds like he added um, more of the blas- black raspberry jam, a little more coffee, and then um, I, b- I believe some more, um, some more honey as well uh, to keep it going. Now he says... Uh, it, it tastes really great. He's really loving it, but a lot of the people that he's letting taste it are getting this ashtray um, nose and taste to it when they're when they're trying it out, and he's wondering where that might come from. What do you guys think about that? Hmm. Ashtray. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's an unusual descriptor. I uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, gosh. <clears throat> ah, that's well, that's a good see. one there. Did, did he use whole berries at all? Yes, I believe he was using the, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if he used whole berries. He said he used a jam made from the, the berries themselves. Uh, but it sounds like he also let it, uh, let it sit on some whole coffee beans. 
Yeah, I'm I'm gonna guess it's got something to do with a vegetal character. A really strong vegetal character might come across um in that way. So it that could come from berry seeds or or the coffee beans either. That'd when, be my uh, you said he used a berry jam. Right. Uh did he add a whole lot of pectic enzyme to it before he started fermenting? I wonder. You know, I don't because see a lot of typically now it depends on uh depends on the berry. Uh there are some berries out there that you really don't need to add pectin uh in order to make jam. Uh but I think most people do, so I mean, the whole idea with pectic enzyme, of course, is to break down the pectins, uh, the cells, uh, structures in in the fruit itself. It's going to be kind of difficult to do, I would think, if you're using jam, because you're actually adding to the pectin. You're adding more pectin at that point. I don't know if that would have something to do with it. Guys, are are any of you, is, is your audio kind of choppy? No, just me. Uh, I hear everybody fine. Everything's same uh, here. Oh. Yeah, you guys, uh, you hearing everybody fine? Chris, uh, I can, uh, can you, I can uh, dump you and call you back if you want. Yeah, yeah, do that. Let's see if we can get a better connection. Sure. All right, uh, little uh, audio problems here, but hey, you know what? This is a two dollar show. Uh, we don't have a budget, and uh, so bear with us. Uh, we try to get Chris back here, um, and I, I really don't. Want, I don't want to do this without Chris. But uh, okay, can you right. hear me? Yes, sir. Can much you better. hear us? Much better. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. Yeah. You know, sometimes Aaron's got that same problem. Uh, he'll connect and. Uh, Everything just goes south, and we'll hang up on him and call him back, and everything's perfect. So, uh, yes, hey. We're good now. Welcome to the Internet. This is Al Gore's fault. He invented the Internet. So, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Like but anyway, climate change? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the political show starts immediately after this one. So, um, <laughs> the uh, – I I was talking about um, the one thing that I caught right off the bat, if he's using jam, guys, is the pectic and the the pectic enzyme thing. If you're making jam, you know, most people throw in some pectin uh, during the cook down in order to make jam. So it's kind of, it seems seems like you'd be adding to the problem uh, at that point. And I don't know if that's responsible for the smell. Uh, or the or the taste of the ashtray thing that he's getting, but uh, that's my that's my only thought on it. Well, it does sure seem like you would need to compensate for the pectin in the jam because you're right. Generally, you need that to set the jam right in the first place. Yeah. You know, and the the one thought I'm having too, I don't know how roasted or roasty of a coffee he used, but maybe if it was. You know, very, very toasted, roasty coffee, like a dark roast. Maybe that could be perceived by some as, as kind of like a burned ashtray type of a flavor as well. Um, just spitball in there. But, yeah, that's that's a new descriptor for me. I've, I've not really heard that before when describing needs. Yeah. It was pretty unique to me, too. So I kind of thought I'd throw it you guys' direction. Hmm. Uh, well, uh doesn't sound like a whole lot of help coming from the mead house here tonight, but, uh, hey, uh, at least we gave it our best shot. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, uh, I'd like to hear more about it. Uh, if we can, uh, you know, if he's watching the show or listening, watching, uh, this is radio, guys. If he's listening to the show, uh, maybe he can give us some more detailed feedback and uh, let us know what's going on with it. Um, anything else, Jeff? Uh, that's what I had for this evening. Perfect. Uh, what are we drinking tonight, guys? Uh, Aaron, what's in your glass tonight? Yeah, tonight I am drinking one of my new favorite beers. This is a, a beer from Ballast Point Brewing Company, and it's called Victory at Sea. It's a porter brewed with coffee and vanilla. And I'll I'll tell you guys, 
that time of year here in Wisconsin. It's like six degrees outside. It is cold as can be. And I've just really been on like a porter and stout kick the last couple of weeks. Just something about this time of year um, is, is conducive to that. So it's really smooth. It's got a very nice, pleasant coffee flavor going on as well. Um, and, and if you guys see this on the shelf, I would definitely recommend picking up a, a six pack of it. That sounds good. Jeff, uh, what's in the cup tonight? Ooh, so I know um, you. we've mentioned on the show a time or two Dragon's Milk by New Holland Brewing. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm drinking one of those, but I'm drinking something different. I found this, believe it or not, in the, the, the clearance section of my local liquor store. It's a Dragon's Milk Reserve. It's their bourbon barrel stout, but they brewed it with uh, with raspberry and lemon. <laughs> oh, wow. Raspberry Ooh. and lemon? Raspberry and lemon. Oh, And, okay. you know, it, it, you guys that have had brag, Dragon's Milk know that it's a pretty strong stout flavor. Yeah. But there's there's actually a pronounced enough fruit flavor to this that it uh, it really comes through. And they, they I am surprised at how well they blend, to be, to be perfectly honest. Wow. <laughs> Wow. What were the fruits good. again you said, Jeff? Was it raspberry and lemon? Raspberry and lemon, huh? Uh, that's an odd combination, I think. Uh, wow, interesting. Uh, I, you know, we get dragon's milk out here. I'm going to have to see if I can locate the reserve uh, and see if I can't get my hands on it. Mississippi, uh, what kind of beer are you drinking tonight? <clears throat> oh, I'm trying out a. Uh... Uh, new. Uh, he was drinking New Holland. I'm drinking New Belgium. Uh, fat tire. It's flat a, tire. It's a fat tire. Fat tire. It's a yeah. It's an amber ale. And, amber uh, ale. Thought I'd give it. A, yeah, I almost didn't have anything to drink. I was. I, I had a, a really odd day. I was <clears throat> watching the the home and garden. TV show channel, and uh, I kind of got in the arts and crafts mood, so I decided to make some Christmas stockings. And uh, but I got kicked out of the fabric store, so uh, <laughs> oh, I didn't. Uh, is, so I didn't is, get the. Is that an after? Is that an after the show discussion? Or is, well, no. What? I mean, it was all a misunderstanding. <laughs> I mean. I went in and the lady said, can I help you? And I said, can I get felt here? And I think she took it the wrong way. <laughs> and, and Too I many beers. Out. <laughs> okay. So I went, so I went beer shopping and I found this uh, fat tire. So it's, uh, only from Mississippi. I swear. Chris has been <laughs> on a, Chris has been on a mission uh, with beer. He's uh this kind of ties into the whole braggart thing that we've got going. I think we, you know, because early when we first started doing a show, guys, Chris is just not a beer drinker. He likes his wine and his mead. Uh, and uh, since we started doing this braggart thing, he's been on this tear. Uh, and uh, he's been brewing beer. He's been drinking beer. And I think he's looking for that perfect combination uh, for a braggart uh but uh, yeah. good since stuff, I didn't Chris. make my stockings, I went I went beer shopping. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, what are you drinking tonight, bud? I'm drinking the Ace of Cascades from Boss Meadery in Madison, Wisconsin. Heck yeah! It is, it is you had this one, Aaron? I have had that one. Please continue, but I've I've got a story to tell about that one. It's uh it's a hopped mead. Um, it's, uh, it's got some nice label art. It's got skull and crossbones, except the crossbones are your, um, your, your bead dippers or sorry, your honey, whatever you call those, you know, the, the, uh, you put in your honey jar. Um, it says this is this hopped up sparkling session mead is made with cascade and Willamette hops. It's, uh, six and a half percent abv it's it's got a lot of honey character i i I don't have my um hydrometer so i you know here where i'm sitting so i don't know what the gravity is on it but it seems to be pretty dry it's got some great hop care or some great uh, honey character and i and and just enough hops i mean it's uh it's 
it's cold right now, so maybe we should check in a little later in the show and see as it comes up to room temperature uh, if if any more of those hops come out. But uh, but with that, Aaron, let, let's hear what you uh, your drunken story about Boss Meter. <laughs> Um, so actually, if you guys remember, maybe a, a couple of months ago, um, we took a vacation, kind of a tour around the state of Wisconsin, and, and one of our stops was in Madison, um, and we had the chance to to visit the Boss Meadery. We we met with Colleen Boss, the you know the mead maker there, um, and had a, a really nice time. But actually, that mead was the very last one that I had of the night there. And just as a, a tip, the way that they suggested that they serve it was actually over um, lemon sherbet. So it was kind of like a, an ice cream drink. And that was just out of this world. Like the lemon the nice, sherbet. Yeah. Wow. Lemon sherbet with the hop flavor, the honey flavor all going on. It was really, really good. Wow. Oh. Kind of reminds me a little bit about a, a little dessert cocktail or whatever you want to call it that that uh, my family does on colder. Typically, it's in the winter. You take a, a cordial glass and you put just a just a little little bit of vanilla ice cream in the in that cordial glass, and then you fill it up with uh, amaretto. Ooh, and that's it. And that's <laughs> that's it. Sounds tasty. Good stuff. Well, I'm drinking. Uh, I'm drinking a bourbon barrel stout tonight as well, guys. This one happens to be from Anderson Valley in Boonville, California. Uh, just found this one on the shelf at uh, I think it was Bevmo. Uh, it's a bourbon barrel stout aged in wild turkey uh, bourbon barrels. It's definitely a stout, but I don't get the bourbon until right at the very end, and it's just ever so slight. Uh, not enough for me. Uh, it's a good beer. Uh, I don't know that I'd buy it again uh, because it's labeled bourbon. If it was just labeled stout, uh, I could live with that and probably buy it again. But because it says bourbon on it, just not getting uh a sufficient amount of bourbon for me uh, to make me want to go buy it again. It just it comes in right at the very end. And, of course, that's that wild turkey uh, coming in there. So uh, that's what old J.D. is drinking tonight. Now, remember we had Ricky the Mead Maker on the show here a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he was talking about uh, the way that they do things there at Groenfell. And recall when he said that they brew their mead at 86 degrees. You remember that? How could we forget? Yeah. We, well, we we all kind of sat back and went, what? Or, or, or more to the point, what the hell? Um, so Chris and I, uh, I think we're, both of us have been pretty eager to want to try this thing out. So uh, I went ahead and did it. Now. Uh, I also recall that he was doing a sizer, uh, the one that he had sent us. Uh, he, he made the comment that he only used 10% juice, apple, uh, in his sizer, which was, a, it was pretty amazing because uh, I, got the, I got the apple taste uh, out of that sizer that he sent. So I thought, well, uh, why don't we add uh, some tart cherry juice to this experiment? So... It's basically this simple, okay? Uh, a little over a pound of wildflower honey uh, with 16 ounces of pure tart cherry juice uh, brought the water, all the liquor, all of that uh, came up to one gallon. I adjusted to reach a gravity of 1.060, pretty low. Uh, and hoping, uh, hoping to make this about an 8% mead or so, 8.5%, uh, using D47. Uh, I threw in a heaping teaspoon of Fermaid K right up front and D47 yeast. And this thing is going to blow your mind. Fermenting at 82 degrees. <laughs> 
So um, today, uh, well, for the past couple of days, uh, it's been at about 1.022. Chris made a comment uh, before we went live tonight. He thinks it might be uh, because of uh, it needs more nutrient. I mean, D47, as you know, it. I mean, it chugs right along quickly. Um, I added uh, yesterday. I also added another eight ounces of cherry juice. I warmed it up to 82 degrees uh, because I tasted it and zero cherry uh, right off the bat. Now remember, this is supposed to be done in three weeks. Uh, this is supposed to be in the bottle and on the shelf uh, in three weeks. So that's what we're shooting for. So uh, we're stuck at one zero two two. Uh, do I add more, you know, do I try to try to jump start it and throw in some more nutrient or what do you guys think? I would check the pH also. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what did it start at again, JD? 1.060. Remember, this is going to be a low alcohol, uh, well, low, uh, low by, you know, typical mead standards. We're looking at around 8% or so. Uh, so we need this to finish out, uh, right down at the bottom. So, uh, you know, somewhere around 1.000 or below. Yeah, and right now, yeah, you're at about, you said 1.022? Yeah. And, uh, and you it's taste? about 5%. Yeah, yeah. How, uh, what's the sweetness like on that? When you just hear to the it, taste? It's not, yeah, when I tasted it yesterday, it's not sweet. Uh, it's not sweet. <laughs> it's very, um, uh, it's 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 very different. I I can taste it. It's getting there. Okay, there's a dryness to it that's coming along. Uh, not quite there yet, but I really don't get a lot of sweet out of it at all. Uh, and there was no cherry well, flavor. So. It's it's entirely too early to to judge anything with flavor, yeah. and at least until fermentation is complete. Uh. I would definitely be checking the pH, and uh, that'd be the first thing. And then I would look at, at maybe the nutrients next. Yeah. This was started, um, if I can get my notes here. I just started this uh, just a few days ago. Uh, so it's still, it's, it's very young. Uh, I want to well, say. Keep this in mind, J.D. You know, you've been... Uh, You've been sort of uh, calling me for advice uh, yep. whenever you started a new mead, and you've you've sort of went down my path with the seventy one B, and you may have gotten used to that. Seventy one B is a is a workhorse. I mean, it it will fight through uh, low pH, low nutrients, all sorts of things, high starting gravities. But now yeah. you're working with something entirely different, and D47 uh, is a you know it's a workhorse yeast also, but it, it there's there's going to be differences as to what it'll tolerate, and I can tell you right now there's not very many yeasts that will tolerate the things that 71B will. So yeah. maybe maybe you've gotten low on nutrients or your pH has dropped. Maybe the cherry juice had, had enough acid in it, or or something. Yeah, could be. I mean, I can well, take a pH reading and and uh, check on it. But uh, go ahead. You know, JD, in one of my calls with uh, Ricky, just setting up our interview with him, um, I joked that I go, oh, "I'll try not to call your cell phone," you know, when I'm in, when I'm in the middle of a batch and have a question. And he said. You know, he goes, hey, you wouldn't be the first guy who who does that. You know, he goes, there's a lot of there's a lot of guys that call me with problems. Um, you know, I, I, if it's if it's something like you know, we're trying to replicate something he's doing, he might be the guy just to ask. You know, uh, yeah. 
what uh, what's going on. I know you've I know you've got his number. Yeah, I, yeah, I do, and I, you know, it, it's not like I haven't given it a thought, but then I hate to impose on the guy too. But uh, I, you know, I just might do it. Um, I did send. Uh, I don't have his direct email address. All I have is the one off his website. I sent a couple of them, uh, and I haven't heard anything back. But uh, of course, that that may be some, you know, like info at Groenfell or whatever. Uh, uh, where somebody else probably uh, sorts through the emails. I, you know, I don't know how many they get on a daily basis, but you know, I, I've got his uh, cell phone number. I could always uh, shoot him a text too, but uh, I'm, I'll think about that. In the meantime, uh, Chris, I'll take a, t- a pH reading and see where we sit on it. Uh, I mean, this is—I mean, if this thing fails, I'm okay with it. Um, you know, obviously, we'd like it to to uh, come out a winner. But uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, I was leery from the start about the high temps. I just, just I got a real problem with that. But hey, uh, I'm willing to give it a shot and give it a try. So, uh, but anyway, so that that's the experiment that uh, I've got going based off of uh, uh, what Ricky was talking about. So now, you know, JD, what what were you doing for nutrients? Fermade K, a teaspoon, uh, just a, a big teaspoon of Fermade K right up front. And, you know, I, what I have on hand is I have, you know, Fermade O is what I've got right now. But I do recall Ricky saying that he liked the Y yeast beer nutrient yeah. uh, that he was using. So I, I wonder if there's something a little bit different in that that just kind of, you know, helps that yeast chug along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. He did mention did you, he likes to dose did that you, pretty heavily too. In, did did you? Uh, I'm sorry. You're you're all right. I, I was just going to say it. It sounded like he dosed that at something like an ounce per gallon, uh, or a really high, uh, really high quantity like that. Um, which you know the the yeast may take that just fermenting at such a vigorous pace there. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I, did I, you did you did you make sure that it was the beer nutrient? Because when I went to look for it, I did notice that Y yeast makes two different nutrients: ones for beer and ones for wine. Ah, uh, yeah, I did not verify which one. And actually, as as I think about it, he just I think he just said the Y yeast nutrient, and he was mm-hmm. speaking in relation to. You know how you, you put so much yeast in beer, you know, and how yeah. it seems like with me, a lot of people ration their yeast, um, which is funny because beer yeast is seven bucks a batch and wine yeast is 99 cents a packet. Um, but no, that that'd be something else we could we could verify with them, you know, if which ones are using. Yep. Well, for the sake of uh, anything, I, I can't. No, nobody or none of the three home brew shops here around me carry the Y yeast nutrients. They all carry this Brewcraft stuff, or uh, only and only one of them carries the Fermate brand. Uh, I guess well, it's not a brand. I, I don't remember what brand it is, but Fermate K. Uh, uh, and then they carry this un, you know, like, you know, brown paper bag yeast is what I call it. I mean, it's like unlabeled, like a home. They probably get it in, in a big, huge container and then divvy it up in these little pill containers. And then that's how they sell it. I mean, I have no idea. It just says, it just says, uh, nutrient, <laughs> you know, but I don't know what it is. That was but. the, that was the first thing I ran into, uh, after we had him on the show, because uh, I think it was that night after we got finished, I I went bopping off, gonna try it, you know. So I went to Northern Brewer and I typed in Y East Nutrient, and up come two different ones. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. well, damn. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, we'll keep up with it, and you know, just see what happens. I mean. Uh, I got four pack. I got three more packs of D forty seven, plenty of honey, and uh, an extra container that I can get a second, uh, you know, a second one started in. So, um, 
so we'll just keep an eye on on this one. And Jamie, uh, I just had had two other questions for you on that before we switch over to to something new. Um, have you been degassing that as well? Oh yes, oh yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Yep. Twice okay. a day. Yep. Gotcha. And then, is there any airlock activity at this point? No. Very, okay. very, very, very little. Very little. I mean, I get up in the morning and there's a bubble sitting in the airlock. Gotcha. Uh, so, uh, very little. Okay. Um, I know it's, I mean, yeah, you know, I can look at the surface uh, and the surface tension and you can see uh, where it's still fermenting, uh, but not nearly as strongly as it was. Uh, because I can still see little bubbles rising up from from the bottom and breaking that surface tension. Uh, so I, I, I know that there's some kind of activity going on, just not a hell of a lot. <laughs> so nothing measurable. Um, uh, so, uh, but like I said, we'll keep an eye on it, you know, and uh, and see what happens. I mean, it, it, it's an experiment. <laughs> so what the heck? Um, Absolutely. Before we get into the uh, uh, to some of the uh, historical uh, things that we wanted to get into tonight uh, on the show, uh, I wanted to throw a shout out to uh, Scott. He jumped on Facebook the other day, and apparently he was uh, listening to our discussion about the graph. Sounds like he's going to get one started. I sent a message uh, via Facebook on our Facebook page. And uh, was wondering about the grains, whether they were crushed or not. And, you know, we didn't really go into a whole lot of discussion on that when we were talking about it. But to anybody who, who who's doing the graph or wants to do that graph, yes, you need to crush the grain uh, in order for it to, uh, for it to work. So uh, uh, that was a question that, uh, that Scott had had. Um, on the Facebook, on our Facebook page, Mike Torrance also uh, sent a message, and uh, he's talking about uh, the cocoa nibs, and it was like like Ryan, I believe, but he also soaks uh, soaks his nibs in a hundred proof grain neutral alcohol or vodka. Uh, to extract the flavors, and he does that with various uh, various things apparently, and uses that to uh, add to his uh, his projects. So I guess that's another way to add flavorings to your mead, guys. Uh, just to soak it uh, in a grain neutral, something like uh, a vodka, uh, and uh, and do it that. I've way. got four ounces. I've got four ounces of nibs and four ounces of vodka right now that's going to go in a chocolate milk stout that I'm doing. And, um, oh, on the graph, uh, let me just say, we we cracked another bottle tonight and um, just to see how it's coming along. And I'm at, um, if I haven't lost count, I'm at two weeks in the bottle. And... This thing changes with, I mean, like every three or four days it changes. Wow. And it'll be good, and then it'll be bad, and then it'll be good again. And <laughs> it, uh, it it hasn't, uh, it, it honestly hasn't settled down to a point where I can make an honest judgment on it yet. Um, so I'm thinking that, you know, I, I may just, I may set this stuff aside for another month, forget about it, just let it do its thing and before I make a final judgment. But uh, I taste it and I go, you know, I think I would rather use the 60L instead of the 120. And then I wait a week and I taste it again and I go, no, nah, I think the 120 was the way to go. And then it's just kind of back and forth. And uh, so it, it's just changing all the time. So yeah. if you make it, don't judge it too early. Yeah, mine uh, mine's sitting in a keg right now, uh, being carbonated. <laughs> so, uh, who did we drop? Uh, Ryan again. Try to get. All right, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, 
we can get Ryan back here again. <laughs> All right. Uh, also, uh, and actually Jeff responded to this one on our Facebook page. This is from Richard Open, Orpen, uh, O-R-P-E-N. He's, uh, uh, listens to the show and, uh, says he enjoys, uh, listening. Uh, he, uh, made a couple of comments. One, uh, one in particular about adding vanilla beans. Wanted to know uh, if you sanitize beans or not, Jeff. And uh, I thought you had a pretty interesting uh, reply to him. Do you recall that? Um, that was a while back. I think uh, I, I think my advice was something along the lines of you could uh, you could sanitize them with some with some vodka, or uh, you know, maybe maybe soak them for a little while in some steeping water uh, to to kill some of the microbacteria, but Really, if you're adding vanilla beans to something that's been fermented for a while, it's not strictly necessary. Um, because yeah. there's a, there's a threshold you cross about 7% alcohol by volume, uh, in a mead where at that point you're, you're really inhibiting a lot of the nasty bacteria and stuff that are, uh, potentially going to take over and wreck your mead. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, usually at that point you can just, you, you can let it sit on the, uh, the, van- the vanilla without much, uh, much to worry about really yeah this was uh you're right it was a while back it was back in october i, I don't know why i just something popped up on the facebook page and i clicked on it and here's these messages sitting there from uh from these different people but uh i guess i have to uh just keep more more uh keep an eye on that uh, stuff on our facebook page more often um, a while back this is uh back in the beginning of our show when we first started we had a discussion, guys, about difficult fermentations, and uh, Aaron uh, was describing one that he had. I've got it uh, pulled up here. Let's take a listen and uh, see what Aaron's talking about. Procedure here um, for for any of the home brewers of beer out there. It was a malt extract kit where it involved steeping some specialty grains um, and then adding in the the malt extract. For a boil, although I think it was only about a 20 or 30 minute boil as opposed to a, a full one hour boil. Um, and what, what happened is after the boil at, at the point when I shut the flame off, um, that is when I poured in some, um, some honey. And this particular difficult fermentation is one that it, it doesn't seem like it's a real common issue that people run into, and it's really the only time I've ran into it. Um, but it's what um, I think in, in Ken Tram's book, he, he refers to it as stratification of the must. And this is a situation where the must can actually separate into two distinct layers of two separate viscosities. And that's essentially what happened to me here is, you know, it, it shot off like a rocket. Um, the braggots that I've done just are very vigorous fermenters um, that will just clog up your airlocks. And I would strongly recommend a, a blow off tube for, for anybody interested in um, doing something like this. Um, but after a few days, it just, kind of puttered out and and separated out into these two distinct layers like that. I think um, the top layer was a, a lighter color, and then the bottom layer was, was a little bit darker of a color. Um, and just following the advice from, from Ken's book, what I wound up doing was just I, I gave it a racking, and in doing so, it just kind of blended it up into those two, um, you know, those those two layers kind of blended together into more of a homogenous uh, mixture at that point. And it just kind of slowly finished out the fermentation from there. Um, it was okay. I, I wonder if maybe it also had, had picked up a, some kind of a contaminant as well. Um, this particular batch came out with just a little bit of a, an off flavor or sour type of a flavor afterwards. Um, but that was, uh, and it, it was okay. It wasn't definitely not my best work, but, um, drinkable, no less. But to me, that was one of the more difficult fermentations that I've experienced. And Aaron, uh, have you seen that since, uh, I have all? not. No, I haven't. I, I have. I'm just tickled that you pulled that up. When I saw in the email string that you wanted to revisit that topic, 
I was excited because with this whole bragging thing that we've been doing, I, I was interested to see if any of you guys encountered that with any of your braggots. Because, like I was saying there, that was the only time I encountered it was on that braggot. Um, which, by the way, JD, that was the, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was the braggot that was like the, the predecessor or the one right before the one that I sent you the bottle of. Oh. Um, so, but no, I, I have not had that happened to me since that one problematic batch chris have you uh did you notice anything like that at all with your braggot no because i used my leaster on it um you know when i started looking into this whole beer brewing thing for the braggots uh i i kind of deduced that the way i preach about uh temperature control with mead um I think aeration before you pitch your yeast is sort of the same thing with beer. Uh, to get the best healthy fermentation in a beer must or in a in a beer wort, yeah, uh, you really got to get some oxygen in there. And uh, so I beat the crap out of it with a drill, and uh, uh, so I most definitely didn't have any problems with things not mixing. Yeah, and uh, I really couldn't say uh, because the, the, the braggot that I did was so dark, you wouldn't have been able to tell anyway. Uh, the one I did uh, was uh, using stout, uh, you know, stout grains for a, for a uh, porter stout. Uh, so the resulting must or wort uh, is very dark. So uh, it, I, I wouldn't be able to tell if it if it happened or not, Aaron. But uh, okay. Well, that's good. You haven't noticed uh, anything since. But you did. You did have another problem as well. Uh, let's listen to this piece about bathroom smells. <laughs> I remember. I'll, I'll tell you an experience that I've had, and uh, this was actually a, a batch of a peach melamel that I made maybe a year or so ago. And this was before I had stumbled across the meadmaderight.com website and had really been exposed to Fermate O or Fermate K. This was back in the dark ages where I was still using, I don't even know what it was, whatever, um, you know, uh, packets of yeast nutrients and yeast energizers that, that my local homebrew supply shop sells. And this was even in the dark ages where I, I wasn't really tailoring the amount of nutrients to use based on things like batch size or starting gravity. Um, so I, I suspect that I added more nutrients to this batch than what was needed. Um, and to me, it's, this is going to sound kind of gross, but um, it kind of like left a little bit of a weird, like, like a like a bathroom smell to it, or like almost like a urine smell. And I know that sounds really <laughs> disgusting, but um, especially like, on radio, yeah. especially on radio, <laughs> yeah. So so well, um, you, you know, uh, Aaron, the uh, the dap is a it's a urea based. Now, now, don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying here because uh, <laughs> there there are some uh, there are some purely urea based uh, things that are that are not even I don't think they're even allowed to be used on a commercial scale. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, I believe that that the DAP is a urea based. Uh, nitrogen, or, or at least part of it, I think. Now, I, I may be wrong about that. And so Chris comes back in and says, yeah, the DAP that you use is uh, urea-based. <laughs> that made us all feel good. Who was, who, was, who was the redneck guy there talking? <laughs> here, we, here we are putting urine in our in our batches of mead. Uh <laughs> But anyway, Chris, have we been able to uh, be definitive about DAP? Is it really a urea based? And does that uh, does that uh, did that result? You think in the bathroom smell that uh, that uh, Aaron was talking about? I don't know if it resulted in it or not, but it def- it is a urea based. Uh, that's that's the uh, that's where the nitrogen comes from. Is is the urea base? So uh, 
is he overfed it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm very sensitive to uh, the dap anyway. I'm one of the few who can taste it if there's yeah. if there's any left over. So, and is that when you it's, when it's you uh, when you taste that dap? Is I mean, what is that what you're tasting? Is that what you're getting out of that? Or no, it's more of a metallic kind of uh, okay. a chemical metallic taste. Yeah. Aaron, have you had uh, any of that problem since then? Fortunately, I can say I have not. <laughs> it, How about anybody know, else? Well, go ahead. I was just going to say, even with that peach one that I was describing there, over time, it's really improved as well. I, I think um, when I remember when when it was young, not only would I have described it as kind of a urea or bathroom type flavor and smell going on there, but I wasn't getting any peach either. And over time, as it's aged, the peach flavor has returned to it. And, and you can really notice that that's there now. So um, I, I guess the, the lesson learned for me is that, you know, they always say it with, with mead, when in doubt, age it out. Yeah. I've got a peach project going that uh, it's just sitting on the back burner for now. I'm not going to touch it. Uh, it's a uh, going to turn out to be a very dry uh, peach, um, and uh, you know I, I'm just uh, going to let it sit. I do recall you talking about it earlier. I remembered this uh, this show, and again, these are shows. I mean, we're going way back, uh, probably the first somewhere in the first ten shows uh uh when you were talking about the uh that particular uh, uh peach uh, mead but uh i uh, i do remember talking about that and uh, yeah chris chris seems to be my go to guy now <laughs> uh he's given me quite a bit of advice uh based off his own experiments that he's done and he warned me about the peach thing so uh, it's coming along and I'm just going to let it sit on the back burner and just let it, uh, you know, keep the airlock full and just kind of let it do its thing. Uh, we'll give it, uh, you know, hell, if it takes a year, it takes a year. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, good things will come around, uh, as we let, let it aid. Jeff, um, Jeff joined the show, uh, I saw he, I was cruising around a Facebook page and, uh, I noticed this guy, Jeff Shouts. He had, uh, gone on about doing this, uh, this big, uh, uh, experiment about using different kinds of yeast. And he had just about every kind of combination, uh, that you could think of, uh, going on. Uh, and uh, later on, as it turns out, we learned that Jeff is actually the third best mead maker in the world. Let's listen to Jeff here for a minute. Yeah, Jeff, uh, the third, uh, the third, uh, world's best mead maker in, in the world. Um, what was the feedback? Well, I, and this was part of my consternation is that I, I really didn't get a lot of feedback. Um, the, obviously the, uh, the third best mead in the world made it through two rounds. Um, the first round, I, I got no feedback whatsoever other than just the scores and the little ticks as to, to what flavors they detected. There was no like actual comments written down on the sheet. And the second round, um, there was a little bit more, uh, there, there was some comment of, you know, some age would improve this. This is a young mead and that's fair. It's, it's a little less than a year old, so it's still, you know, it's still aging up to where it ought to be. Um, but yeah, that was really all the commentary I got on that. And I, that was a little bit, uh, you know, frustrated when I opened up my score sheets because it, to me, it's, it's all well and good, you know, winning medals and little cups and everything. But the reason I started getting into to competing in these was not to win medals or to, you know, to win awards and stuff. It was, it was really to get feedback from people that are, you know, more knowledgeable in this area than I am because, you know, pretty much since I started brewing, my, uh, my main feedback other than my own palate has been, you know, friends and family. And 
you know, really, I don't think I've, according to them, I don't think I've ever brewed a bad mead. Yeah, and they're it's not all been gonna, fantastic. They're not going to lie to you and tell you your mead tastes like crap either, are they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, back with Jeff, uh, Jeff, you know, it turns out you, you, uh, you went through the process, you became a judge. Uh, how important is it, uh, giving that feedback? You kind of found out, uh, through your own, uh, uh, you know, com- uh, competing, uh, uh, how important it is, but h- how do you personally feel about it as being a judge, uh, giving that feedback? You know, I, um, granted, I've not had a lot of opportunities to use my judge qualification, but in the, uh, the, the couple rounds of judging that I have done this year, um, I, I always tried to make it a point to point out, you know, the things that I liked about, um, the, the quality I was asked to be judging as well as the things that I didn't like. And I think that's fair. I think when people submit a, um, a mead to a competition, they're looking for objective feedback and they want to know what they can do to improve it. Um, now, if you remember from this episode, this was this was about the Mazer Cup, and we're talking about a competition that judges something in the order of 450 different like homebrew meads in a single day. So right. I, I get that the judges don't have a lot of time for each individual mead, um, yeah. and it, it, it's frustrating, but that's fine. Um, they have a lot on their plate, and that's that's understandable. Yeah. Uh, that, and that and said, as a though, side note to this, as a side note to this, the Mazer Cup was in March, and we're in December. We've been on the air for a while. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Thirty. Uh, I think this is thirty-three shows uh, tonight. Marks thirty-three shows. So, and we do one a week, didn't and we've to, been off a couple. Didn't of weeks, mean so. to, Yeah, I didn't mean to get off the subject there, Jeff. I just had to point that out. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, hey, you know, whatever works here. Uh, this is basically a scriptless show, so uh, whatever comes to your mind. Um, and that's what's fun about this, uh, you know, about doing this show is nothing is scripted. You know, we have some brief show notes that uh, we toss around, kind of give us a, you know, here's what we're going to start out. But many times we kind of wander off and talk about something completely different. So I think that's the cool so thing Jeff. about it. Yeah, it is. It's it's the best. I want to ask Jeff, though, as a judge, um, I send in my entry, and and you you're assigned to to taste it, okay? And you get it, and it's not right up your alley. It's not the kind of thing that you want to be drinking. Um, it's probably too sweet for you, and it's most definitely a dessert mead. Uh, so how do you how do you approach giving me feedback on something that you personally don't like, but it may be appropriate for the style? Well, and here's the wonderful thing about the the program that the BJCP has set up, and I'm I'm not going to say that the BJCP is is you know all knowing and wonderful. There there are some. Uh, um, some some fair criticisms and some you know, people have raised against them that I think um, that's okay. But one thing they do really well is that they give you these these broad categories with style descriptions and um, the, uh, the 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 multifaceted ways that a beer could fit into this style, um, the the things to look for when you're judging it, and the things that would be counted as a fault and. You know, I think a great example of that, I was judging a beer uh, this past summer for a local competition um, that's, I can never pronounce this name right, Gose, Goza? Um, Goza. Goza. Goza, thank yeah. you. There it is. Not my favorite kind of beer. I don't like sea salt flavor in a beer. Um, mm, yeah. But, you know, it was very well executed. Uh, there were... There were two um, real standout beers on that flight that I judged, um, which was historical styles of beer. Um, the other one was a uh, a root beer stout. And the only reason that root beer stout didn't win is because there really is no established criteria for what a root beer should taste like as a beer flavor. Um, so it got really high marks, but the Gosa had to take the, the win. Um, and 
you know, it, it scored really, really highly, despite me not particularly liking the style of beer. Um, because it, it, it met all the criteria, what it was looking, what it was looking for. And even I have to admit for a style of beer, I don't like, it was very nicely executed. Um, mm. I'd love to say that all judges are that objective about it and can, can kind of look past personal preference. Um, from my experience, not all of them have, I've, I've definitely disagreed with some comments, but this, this whole judging and competition system is still a fantastic way to get very objective feedback. Uh, from from other people that are experienced in this field and i highly recommend you know there is the mazer cup there's a few other really big meat competitions but almost every major city has a homebrew club and most of these homebrew clubs will sponsor a yearly event that may or may not include mead i mean look at it i mean get involved these are great opportunities to get some some objective feedback um meet more people that are interested in brewing stuff and just generally you know, grow as a brewer. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best way too, because, you know, giving it to your family, I know if it was my family, they'd probably come back and say, what the hell are you trying to do? Poison us. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't know that you really get, I mean, you, you know, you, when you, you have friends and, uh, you know, you give your stuff to your friends or your relatives. I don't know that they really honestly come back with, with honest feedback. Uh, I, I really think you're probably better off maybe sending it to somebody who's going to be a little more objective, like a, like a judge. So, uh, I, I, you know, it comes I, down to who matters, who matters most? Is, does it matter yeah. that you are making something that the majority of people enjoy or that's true to style? Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm making it for something that I enjoy. I could care less if anybody. I mean, if somebody else enjoys it, fine. But I'm not making my stuff for other people. I'm making it for me. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, that's a big, uh, that makes a big difference, uh, in, you know, as far as, as far as me personally. But yeah. go ahead. When I make stuff, the only palette more important than mine is my wife's. Yeah. And here, here. yeah. And and that's the way I make it. I know what she likes, I know what I like, and like I said, if if other people don't like it, good. They're not gonna ask me for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or ask you for more. <laughs> um I think Chris has gotten himself stuck in that rut because they they keep asking him for more. <laughs> oh yeah, my, my problem is they go, This stuff it wasn't the best you've ever made. Have you got any more? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, and again, I mean, uh, you know, it depends on who you're making it for. I mean, if you want to submit it to a judge and get a real good, honest input, uh, you know, I would, I would do that. I, I'm not looking for trophies. I'm not looking for medals or anything of, of that nature. I could care less. But what I am looking for is the feedback from a judge. I want to know that, you know, what I'm doing, my processes, my methods uh, are producing some good meat. Um, that just, it's, it, I guess it's a confidence builder uh, more than anything for me. Uh, and, I mean, I could care less what other, you know, my friends and relatives, I don't care what they think about it. What's important to me is what I think about it. Um, you know, so... Uh, but talking talking about Chris, uh, we did a show. Uh, we were talking. I think we were talking about uh, some different honeys, and uh, Chris started talking about uh, some honey down in Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> uh, just kind of funny. Yeah, if you, you really have to know Mississippi, Chris. But uh, let's take a listen to uh, to Chris here. The problem with our honey, as I've said before many times, uh, we're blessed with a really good, warm climate. Uh, and it's warm here, you know, uh, 325 days of the year. <laughs> yeah. So, rub it uh, in. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, it's great for, uh, it's great for going swimming, but it's not so great. Uh, when you've got that many, you know, anything that can grow, grows here. And so every flower bed around here has got marigolds. 
uh, which are the most bitter, vile thing you ever tasted. Uh, <laughs> Mississippi is the magnolia state. We've got magnolia blossoms everywhere. The most beautiful smelling flower you've ever smelled. Absolutely awful in honey. <laughs> So we've got lots of pasture land, so we've got a lot of milkweed. We've got a lot of bitterweed. Uh, we've got a lot of pasture thistle, which is very bitter. Uh, and, uh, by the way, pasture thistle is a whole other world from star thistle. Star thistle is excellent, honey. Pasture thistle, not so much. So <clears throat> if you get local honey from here, you're getting this huge, bitter, sour bomb. It, it's awful. It's great. It's it's great to put on your biscuits. It's wonderful table honey. You ferment that stuff down, and it's just undrinkable. Oh wow! Uh, and and it always makes me jealous when I hear people talking from other parts of the country. They talk about oh we we have the most wonderful local honey. Find your local beekeeper. And I tell everybody around here, avoid your local beekeeper <laughs> because <laughs> this is not what you want here. Uh, so, uh, Chris, just how good is that honey in Mississippi anyway? <laughs> I think you just you just heard the whole story. Oh, <laughs> uh, jeez. Uh, well, you you talked about star thistle, this thistle, that thistle. Uh, now, if you live in Mississippi and and you want to make mead, uh, you know Scott uh, Scott Monroe lives down there in Mississippi near you too. So you guys are are pretty much limited uh, as far as sourcing honey. Uh, you know, with any any degree of of of. of uh, you know, trying to find something that's usable. So you got to go out of your what county, state. I mean, you're stuck. Aren't well, you? yeah this this general area. Um, you know, there's there's some good honey that comes from over in eastern uh, Tennessee and and uh, from the Carolinas up in the mountains. There's some good honey that comes from down in South Alabama. Uh, we we call it. Uh, L.A., uh, Lower Alabama. Um, Lower Alabama. I bet the Alabamans yeah. love that. <laughs> yeah, from down in L.A. Uh, the, uh, there's some good honey that comes from um, South Georgia uh, and, and of course, all over Florida. But I don't know. There's something about this general area. Like I said, it's just... Uh, it, it just doesn't ferment down to something that's it's enjoyable. It's not that good floral, mild floral character that you get from other wildflower honeys. And uh, of course, we we've got too much stuff growing here to have any you know single varietal honey. That would be nearly impossible. And uh, uh, you know the biggest I, I don't know uh, I, I see probably maybe two three hundred acre farms is about as big as you see around here so it's not really big enough to to produce a single variety what, so, what are they what uh, are they know. growing what are they growing on the farm around here yeah what's what's the crop down there? Uh, around here it's either going to be cotton soybeans or corn hmm. uh mostly cotton and soybeans and um uh, I, you know, I don't know what kind of honey that would make in particular, but like I said, you you very seldom see a farm in this particular area that's big enough to to provide a single source honey, a single variety. Uh, so you know, they we're we're lucky, I guess. We are within a reasonable driving distance to get honey, like from Eastern Tennessee or something, but. When it comes to making meat, it's just so much easier to jump online, and uh, you, you're going to pay a premium, uh, mostly in shipping. Sometimes shipping charges cost as much as the honey. But if you're going to do this and you're going to make good meat, you've got to get good honey. Yeah, and that kind of drives the the overall investment up in in your meat project as well, too, doesn't it? 
Yeah, that's why I use buckets instead yeah. of <clears throat> stainless steel for <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> well, I, um, you know, here again, we were, we were cruising around, uh, I was cruising around the Facebook thing, uh, here a while back. I don't remember what show this was on. Uh, we're, this is probably maybe, oh, going to say probably about 12 shows or so. Ryan can probably tell us. Um, but I found, uh, I found this post by this guy. Uh, he was talking about a sizer, and of course, what what really what really popped out at me was the mention of a bourbon barrel stave, and uh, this was in a sizer that he was doing. This is uh, Ryan. Uh, this is your first show with us, and uh, the rest is history. Let's take a listen to what Ryan says about his bourbon barrel stave. You. Uh... Yeah, you uh, you put it on the Meat House Facebook. Uh, you made a traditional sizer with apple juice and honey, and uh, oaked it with uh, a bourbon barrel stave. That is correct. How did that turn mm-hmm. out? Well, it's it's still in the process of working out right now. Used uh, the one gallon batch of uh, cider. Used a pound of uh, alfalfa honey. Uh, brought it to uh, 1065, fermented all the way down to uh, 0.98. Uh, had it have it on the bourbon barrel stave for about a week now. Uh, I'm going to leave it in for at least another week or so, and then I'm going to use some uh, apple juice concentrate to uh, back sweeten. You know, after to, to bring up that sweetness just a little bit. Okay. And it'll probably promote the apple flavor uh, at the same time a little bit more, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. But that, uh, you know, just even one weekend, that stave is starting to bring a nice oaky and just a just a little at this point, just a hint of that uh, bourbon bourbon flavor and uh, uh, essence to it. Yeah. Now, did you uh, did you soak that bourbon barrel stave in any bourbon before you added it, or did you just uh, you got it that way and and put it right into your sizer? Yeah, yeah, I got it uh, from a home brew shop um, that way, and I I just uh, sanitized it and uh, and put it in just as is. So uh, I got to ask you, Ryan. Uh, let's go back to that bourbon barrel stave sizer you made. Was it any good? So, I, so far, I've only done sampling of it, and uh, it's well. Let me just say, it's something I, I will do again. Um, it's it, it's good. Uh, the stave that I use, you know, when you, when you buy a whiskey barrel stave, and I bought mine from the homebrew shop. Um, you don't know what kind of whiskey it was in. You kind of, you know, you don't know how long it's been on the shelf, how much it's kind of dried out a little bit. Um, since then, uh, I've decided on a few tweaks. Um, but let me, let me go back to the, the one that I, that we're talking about there in the clip. Uh, mm-hmm. you heard me say that what I was going to do was, was bring it up a little bit with some apple juice concentrate. Um, I've tasted a little bit. I didn't like the the bourbon flavor that it was imparting, um, and that's a strong way to say it. But it just it almost tasted thin, maybe a little stale, um, kind of like a bad rye. And that's mm-hmm. and again, I know that's being harsh, but but if we want to be critical here and talk like you're the world's best third you know third best beer judge. Um, <laughs> You know, I, it's what I should say. Um, anyway, uh, so what I've decided to do with that batch is um, instead of trying to cover it with sweetness, you know, I think I'm going to let it, I'm going to add a little bit to it. I'm going to add, you know, an, an inch or two of a vanilla bean and a cinnamon stick. And because I think those two flavors will play well off the bourbon. And actually, I might put a, you know, a tablespoon of bourbon in with it, too. Um, I'm not ready to give up on it yet, and that's that's a problem I have. I know JD. A lot of times, you when you don't like something, you 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 know you you clean the drains with of LA with, <laughs> yeah. with your stuff. Yeah. My my 
my issue is I keep trying to tweak it. I keep trying to tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak. And it's kind of like, I never say die. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, so, so I keep trying with it. Um, so Good that's, that's where I'm at right now with it. Have what I cons- will do in the, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, have you considered, uh, is, is it, is it oak enough or have you considered pulling that out and maybe soaking some cubes in some good bourbon bourbon that you know, or you're familiar that's, with, or is it past that point? No, that's exactly where I'm going with the second batch. The second batch instead oh. is, is I'm going to, I'm going to use cubes, you know, oak, charred oak cubes that I'll, that I'll soak in the bourbon of my choosing. And I've got some going right now, uh, in a, in a Minnesota, uh, whiskey. Um, and, and that's, you know, we, we always talk about the importance of, you know, quality in, quality out, you know, crap in, crap out, you know, that kind of thing. And I think it really starts, you know, I'm saying this after we listen to a clip of, uh, of Mississippi saying how, um, jealous he is when people say, you know, you get to know your beekeepers and that kind of thing. Uh, to me, you know, it's going back to the basics. It's, I'm blessed with having a lot of great beekeepers around. I, you know, I found a beekeeper that, that's got a, a, a good, nice, nice, good wildflower honey. You know, I've tasted it, you know, I mean, it's before I bought it, you know, I bought a five gallon, 60 pound pail of it. You know, I mean, I, I know where that honey's coming from yeah. at the same time. I want to know the kind of bourbon or whiskey that's in my, that, that I'm, that I'm going to use, you know, and, and, and all, all the way through. So I'm, uh, you know, going back to the start in that regard. So it, it's, to me, it is, uh, it, it is something that I enjoyed and it's something that I will continue this, this, uh, bourbon barrel sizer. Uh, it just comes down to, um, uh, going starting starting with with this base level how you're going to do it now the interesting other variable that i'm considering is would there be a difference and 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 i don't let me know what you guys think is there a difference if you add the oak cubes or or stave um during the beginning of fermentation and we know it's sanitary because it's it's been you know it's been in whiskey it's nothing's going to live in that so or uh you know would it or change would it change the flavor if you um if you added it in secondary or would it make no difference you know and i, and I don't know I, you know the first time i did it I, I added it during fermentation and it fermented out and that might have been a little bit of the cause of the flavor um as opposed to dropping a few cubes in you know, in secondary when fermentation, you know, is all but done. I don't know, guys. You know, I can I can tell you something uh, about one of the characters you get from oak is the vanilla. That's one of the big characters. Um, even even if it's not initially perceived as vanilla, it's from the vanillin that's in the wood. And uh, I do know from some of my research that there are processes that take place during fermentation that will um, break down some of the flavor components of vanilla. Now, whether or not that holds true for the vanilla that comes from an oak stave or not, I don't know. But that's possible. Maybe that's why you didn't get, you know, the complete results you were looking for. Um, it's, It's also the reason that I never add a vanilla bean during fermentation because the majority of it's going to get broken down. So something to consider. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, that does make a lot of sense. You know, that if if it was me, I, I think I would prefer to put it in secondary because that way at least you can control the amount of flavorings, uh, uh, and impact that you're going to get from the Oak and, and the bourbon. Uh, even adding the bourbon, uh, I, I think it's pointless to put the bourbon itself in up front. That's something that you would want to add in secondary. I go back to my bragging. Uh, 
my wife and I went on a basically a bourbon hunt, uh, and we scavenged around uh, and came back with all different kinds of bourbon. And we settled on one in particular that, that we really liked, uh, and that was Eagle Rare by uh, Buffalo Trace. And uh, we thought it was a very nice-tasting bourbon. Uh, I soaked the oak cubes in it uh, while, you know, during fermentation, added them into secondary. Uh, and right now it's in a keg. I took a taste of it the other day as it's carbonating. I'm, I'm liking it. Um, so uh, for me, things like that would have to go into secondary. But uh, Jeff Barron, you got another take on it? I would absolutely say put that in secondary. I mean, anything, especially with oak flavor, um, which you you guys that have been listening to the show know that I am a big fan of oaking mead. I would oak almost any style of mead for to some extent or another, just because it does so many wonderful things as far as body and mouthfeel and just kind of rounding out the natural acidity and honey. It's a wonderful thing, but you can yeah. overdo it. And that's something you really need to be able to control and dial in. Uh, so whether you're going to soak it on oak or you're going to do like um, like a couple of people we mentioned towards the top of the show uh, do with, with their uh, tannin additions or flavor additions, you've got to be able to control it somehow. And adding those flavors in secondary is is really the best way to control it. Aaron? No. You know, not sure there's much else I can add. I, I agree with, with everything you guys are saying. I, I think that's the way to to be able to control it and really dial it in. Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was going to say, you know, we, we were trading emails a week or so ago and we were talking about what you do with uh, leftover ingredients. Yeah. And with me, it comes down to, uh, is it an ingredient that will lose integrity over time or is it an ingredient that's shelf stable? And if the, ingredient loses integrity over time i'm inclined to try to make an extract out of it you know like we we talked about you know you can make a you know a cocoa nib extract you can make a hop extract you can you know and hops are notorious for losing integrity over time unless you maybe properly freeze them or something um anyway what i was just thinking i've never seen one i've never heard of one i don't even know if they exist but you know, could you make a an oak extract, you know, and and add, you know, I mean, I guess it'd kind of be like liquid smoke or something, you know, like you use, you know, you know in your barbecue, but, uh, you know, just, just soaking oak for a very long period of time, you know, could you add that a, a, a tablespoon at a time? And I, I don't know yes. the answer to that one. Yes, yeah, I've actually done can. that. It yeah. works. If you're gonna, there's if you're a, gonna, there's an episode on on YouTube, uh, Northern Brewer. What is it? Uh, Brewing TV. Brewing um, TV. Yeah. Yeah. There's an episode uh, on their cider. Look up their cider episode, and they actually made an extract with oak. And rather than oaking the cider, they added uh, a few dropper fulls. Yeah, and look at it this way: if you're gonna if you're gonna soak oak in bourbon, all right, the result that you're gonna get is a few ounces of really oaky tasting bourbon. Why couldn't you do the same thing in a uh, in a you know in a in a like a hundred proof uh, vodka? Uh, you're still gonna get that oaky flavor, uh, and a neutral spirit like vodka. Uh, you know, isn't going to impart any any flavor of that particular alcohol, but you're certainly going to get the oak, uh, big time. So, you know, if you if you, if you think that's a load of crap, go ahead and soak your oak cubes in a little bit of bourbon, and then drink the bourbon. <laughs> you better have a plastic bucket by your side too when you do. So, <laughs> that's I had a, a friend that's over a, for. Uh... For messing around with some of the the stuff I have in in progress, um, and just kind of working with some stuff, I pulled out my little uh, bell jar full of oak tincture, um, and gave him a half a shot of it. Um, yeah, no, that he was expecting it was some kind of a a, a mead, and it, he was poorly <laughs> surprised. 
Yeah, and it's it's not going to taste like a nicely oaked bourbon either. I guarantee it. So, but no, uh, I drink a, I drink a similar amount, and no, it, it is not pleasant. No. <laughs> so, um, this next clip, uh, you know, when I first started making this mead, I was like, I was like hyper on on all this sanitizing stuff, and I mean, there was a point where you could actually do heart surgery. Uh, in my kitchen, I was so freaking anal about it. But uh, here's uh, here's old JD talking about it. I sanitized everything: the countertops, the stove, the floor, the ceiling, everything. Uh, and uh, my my kitchen, I mean, you could you could perform heart surgery in it. Uh, that's how fanatical I was about this. And I've calmed down quite a bit from there, but. Uh, you know, I didn't want the risk. I, you know, I'm giving this stuff to friends and relatives. I didn't want somebody's wife coming back and say, "Hey, you know, Bob died last night from drinking your wine." <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, but I, it's a good practice. You know, those of you listening to the show out there, you should get into the habit. Switch up your your, uh, uh, you know, your sanitizing uh, material. You know, look at Star Sand, the Iota Four. And, you know, this uh, uh, metabisulfite, which is, you get at your local brew shop. You know, if you got if you use those three, you're, you're pretty well set. I know there are probably other products out there on the market I'm not familiar with, but those are the three that I am. And uh, it's good practice to get into, and we highly encourage you to do that. So There is uh, one more warning that I want to throw out as long as we're talking about this. Uh, sure, with yeah. the sulfite-related sanitizers um you do want to be careful with the amount of amount you use um and yes. it's actually common to use a sulfite in in the winemaking industry as well to kind of uh stabilize the meat the yeah. problem with sulfites though is that there are there's a small segment of the population that's very sensitive to sulfites and it can give them very strong headaches um yeah there are uh, it, it's not a large segment of the population, but those that are affected by it are affected very powerfully by a very small amount of it. So, a couple of things out of this, guys. Um, I, I want to throw it over to Jeff and then to Chris. Uh, Jeff, you're talking about metabisulfite and how actually dangerous that could be to people who have uh, an allergic uh, uh, reaction, even, or it can cause. Uh, people to get the, these headaches, and then uh, we'll throw it over to Chris. Uh, Chris, because you know he's he's a doctor, he he's a surgeon. Uh, it's a common practice in in hospitals apparently to rotate uh, sanitizing uh, material. But Jeff, talk about the metabisulfite thing again. Let's kind of reiterate on that. Sure, and this is this applies not only to metabisulfite but also to um the use of, of uh, sulfite-based sanitizers as well, just as a, a precautionary tale, because I used to rinse my, my balls in sulfite before I bottled, uh, before I moved over to using predominantly star sand. Um, there is a really small part of the population that's very sensitive to sulfites, and they can get some ridiculously bad migraine-style headaches, uh, even from a very small concentration of sulfite in the, the final product. Um, there are I, I've even heard of some judges having uh, problems with sulfated wines or meads in competitions as well. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of. Not everybody is uh, has a problem with that. Most of the, uh, most of the population doesn't. Um, but there is that small sec section of the population um, that is going to be sensitive to it. Yeah. Now, is metabisulfite a sanitizer that you have to rinse? The the metabisulfite is actually the addition we use to uh, to inhibit yeast um, for stabilization. Um, I don't think that's the same as the sulfite solution that I was using as a um, as a sanitizer, and I want to say that was not a rinse sanitizer. Sizer. I don't want to. I want to say that was not a rinse sanitizer so much as just a drain sanitizer. Yeah. Let's uh, let's let's go to Chris. Uh, you know, Chris, your experience in the uh, in an operating theater, being a surgeon, uh, you had talked to one. You know, might have been on the show too. Uh, 
you know, we, we were talking about sanitizers and it might've been you that brought up just prior to uh, me talking about it here on that clip. The fact that hospitals rotate sanitizing solutions or sanitizers uh, periodically for a specific reason, right? Most of uh, the ones that I'm aware of do um, usually on a, uh, a either a four or six month rotation. Um, all microorganisms, or all living things adapt. And the smaller and the simpler the organism is, the faster it adapts. Uh, it's much the same reason that bacteria will become resistant to certain antibiotics. So, uh, you know, that that's what we're fighting is the microorganisms. And if you use the same sanitizer for a long period of time, uh, the the and the ecosystem within your home or your brewing environment will eventually adapt to that, and you may start to get infections. So it's a good idea about every six months or so to to rotate to use star sand and and then switch over to iota four. Um, as far as the sulfite solution, you can use the uh, the metabi sulfite, but it is a rinse. Uh, it does need to be rinsed. Um, and the the dosage for that, for sanitation purposes, is one Camden tablet per cup of water. And uh, so you can crush up um, one tablet in a cup of water, dissolve it, put it in a spray bottle, spray things down, and then use whatever water you're going to brew with, uh, use that same water to rinse. If it's clean enough to go in your beverage, it's clean enough to rinse your equipment. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, and that's good uh, that's good information to know and probably a good practice to get into. Uh, would it be okay if you just uh rotated two of the uh let's say you just had iota 4 and and star sand. Uh, and if you did that every 6 months, uh would you be safe at that point, do you think? You would be much better than using just one, yes. Yeah. Uh, I very seldom use uh, sulfite solutions for anything other than stoppers and the seals on my bucket lids. And for those of you uh, who use star sand regularly, if you use rubber stoppers or rubber seals or gaskets, if you've ever made up a star sand uh, solution that was a little bit too strong, you already know where I'm going with this. Uh, you will get the most awful rotten egg smell uh, because the the acid in the star sand will start to break down the rubber. And uh, if you don't believe me, go go mix up some some uh, star sand at a little bit higher concentration than you should, and soak a rubber stopper in it. And <laughs> that once once that smell, once that odor gets into your mead it will not come out. You might as well chuck it down the drain. Um, so so the uh, so you suggest using what silicone material, silicone stoppers uh, at that yes, point? Yes, you then, can right? use, uh, if you can get silicone stoppers, that's the perfect solution to it. But uh, I've got a lot of rubber stoppers that I still use that are perfectly good stoppers. And uh, so I usually will just keep a bottle of uh, either sulfite solution or iota four, and I use that exclusively on my stoppers and and the the lids to my buckets have these little rubber seals uh, gaskets around them, and I use it on yeah. that as well, uh, just to prevent because sometimes I make up star sand a little bit stronger than normal. Uh, and but it will it will definitely break down that rubber into a into an awful egg smell. Interesting, uh, interesting, and good advice. Um, well, guys, it's been thirty three shows, uh, and uh, gosh, it, it doesn't seem like uh, it's been that long. But you figure thirty three weeks is uh, uh, how long we've been going at this, and uh, actually you've just a little bit longer because I think we've had a couple of breaks in there uh, already, but uh, it's been a hell of a lot of fun. Just wanted to kind of recap on some of the older shows, some interesting things that I thought we talked about. 
And there's a whole lot more. And for listeners who are just turning, tuning in for the first time, uh, themeathouse.com. Uh, they're all piled up uh, on our website. You can go to iTunes and get them. You can go to Stitcher Radio and get them. You can go to Podcastpedia and get them. Uh, they're out there, and they're out there everywhere. So uh, uh, let's finish off uh, tonight, guys. I, I know that there was an idea we were tossing around uh, trying to hook up some recipes as a, kind of a Christmas gift for all of our listeners. And uh, we wanted to put some stuff out there that, uh, you know, that we've had some pretty good luck with. And uh, I know, Chris, you've got something planned uh, for the Christmas uh, the Christmas week. Uh, what, what's your plan there for, uh, for our listeners? Well, I've I said I've been promising for a long time that I was going to get this heart murmur recipe out there. I've just got to get it typed up and and uh, sent to you so you can post it. But that's going to be my my Christmas gift. Is uh, this is a long term project that I've done so many test batches on, and I think I finally got it down to uh, where I wanted it. So <clears throat> that's going to be my contribution. And this is, uh, if you can break it down just a little bit, this is kind of a, uh, this is a pseudo, not even a pseudo, this is kind of a modified uh, uh, project that Ken Schramm had done, correct? Well, it's it's modeled after his most famous mead, which is the Heart of Darkness. And, uh, you know, he grows all of his own fruit, and uh, he knows all the right proportions and everything. And I, I set out cause we can't get it here. And, uh, and even when he makes it, it, it's sold before it's bottled. So, I mean, literally it's gone, uh, the day it's released usually. So, uh, it's almost impossible unless you live within driving distance of his metery, you can't get a bottle of it. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to find a way to make something, as close as possible that everyone could do. And, um, I have this really big obstacle. Uh, I've never tasted it. So, (laughs) (laughs) so how do I, how do I make something that as close as possible when you've never tasted it? So, you know, this was, this was ambitious right from the start. So I, I went online and I read every tasting note and every review that I could find on the heart of darkness. And I called people who have had it. And, um, I mean, I, I did everything I could possibly do. And at the end of the day, I, I weeded out all the fluff and I found all the common denominators. What's the, what are, what are the things that, that everyone seemed to say about this mead that, that everybody had in common about it. And I came up with this handful of descriptors for it and I knew the ingredients. So it all came down to, uh, proportions and balance and how much of each thing do I use and sweetness levels and all this kind of stuff. So it took a lot of experimental batches to finally yeah. get it dialed in. Yeah, a bunch. I, and, I, I've uh, uh, I've known Chris for oh god, Chris, it must have been a couple of years, at least a couple of years. Two or three. Two or and, three. Years, yeah. Uh this goes this goes way back to when I was producing the show for Got Mead Live. And Chris uh this this guy Chris uh was always calling in. Uh he was always calling in the show. Uh, you'd see a few postings now and again uh, on the forums over there uh, from Chris. Uh, but when we, when we launched the show, uh, Chris would call in, and it wasn't, I mean, it was just within several weeks, he starts talking about this this heart murmur thing. And this went on for, and I just it just went on and on and on. I mean, it got to the point where we all, all everybody on the show recognized the phone number that was coming in we knew that it was Chris coming from Mississippi and we knew at some point he's going to talk about this heart murmur thing. Now I can, I can verify 
that he has worked and worked and worked batch after batch after batch uh, on this heart murmur thing. So uh, I'm telling you, if you're lucky enough to get a bottle from him, it's going to be good. I guarantee it. Mm, well, let's don't let's don't go that far. <laughs> uh, I I got it to where I thought it needed to be, and uh, you know, one of these days when I get to taste a batch of the real uh, Heart of Darkness, I, I may be totally surprised. But I, I honestly believe that that I've taken commonly available ingredients that anyone can get from the store. And I've created uh, the best melomel that can be made using those particular ingredients um, based on the descriptions that I've read of the Heart of Darkness. Yeah. Now, whether it's like the Heart of Darkness, I'm sure it's not. Uh, I think this is as good as you're going to get with store-bought ingredients. So uh, we'll leave it at that. And, well, and, I know, uh, you know, I know, I mean, we used to do the after show too uh, on, on that other show. And I know that a few times I heard comments like, God, that Chris, he's obsessed with that heart of darkness thing or that heart murmur thing. <laughs> so it has well, been I an mean, obsession, hey, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it was, uh, it's, it's arguably the most famous mead being produced today. Yeah. Uh, the, he makes uh, usually one batch a year at harvest time when he harvests his fruit he pits all of his cherries by hand he picks all of his fruit uh, you know it's difficult to replicate something like that just by running down to the store and buying some juice or something uh, you're never going to get and, and not to mention his what 20 some odd years of meat making experience yeah. um you're not going to replicate something like that and i know and i know you can't but it's uh i think it was it's not really so much of an obsession as it is a challenge i like a good challenge and yeah. what what better challenge to take on than to try to make something that is probably the most famous and expensive mead being made today that you've never even tasted yeah. <laughs> and you want to, yeah. you know, that's like the ultimate challenge. So it was yeah. all in fun. And, uh, I think I got a pretty good bottle of meat out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, guys, uh, the music's queued up that, uh, pretty much brings us to the end of our show here tonight. Uh, we're going to be off for a couple of weeks and I want to remind everybody, all of our listeners, Hey, have a very Merry Christmas. Uh, be safe out there and to our crew here, uh, on the Mead house, man, what a time we've had, uh, you know, uh, take a look back from where you came and uh, keep a good eye out to where you're going. I want each and every one of you guys to have a very Merry Christmas and a happy new.